welcome to the very first video podcast for the history of chocolate. There are actually 12 of these podcasts and they accompany every unit of the course. You should listen to them as part of your regular coursework that you do for each unit. They serve as an introduction to the main ideas and concepts that will be covered in that particular unit. And like the module introduction videos, they're not meant to be a substitute for doing the readings. The readings are very important and contain content that you can be tested on. In this unit, we're going to look at chocolate and historical study. The learning outcomes for this unit are Number one, recognize the difference between primary and secondary sources. Number two, understand how historians make conclusions about the past. Number three, explain what original research means and how it applies to primary and secondary sources. And number four, explain the concept of historiography. Think for a second, how do we know anything about the past? I mean, how do we know anything, anything at all? When you watch a television documentary which talks about ancient Egypt, how does anyone know that any of those things actually happened? If a historian says to you that there were castles and knights in shining armor during the Middle Ages, how do they actually know that? How do we know anything about the past? You've probably learned all sorts of things about history without even realizing it. There's sources that talk about history all around us. Sources that are in our popular culture. You've probably read a book at least once which took place or had a scene in it which took place sometime in the past and you learned a little bit about that time period as a result. Almost certainly you've seen a movie at one point in time which took place in a past time period. Plenty of television shows are depicting a time period from long ago. Things like Downton Abbey, Mad Men, or even the new popular show Vikings. There are even video games which take place in historical time periods from long ago. All of these are sources which have informed you in some way about the past. Now if you thought about it, you could probably imagine that historians or archaeologists look at even different sources. So. Maybe they might find old diaries or letters. They might dig through the archives of an old library and find other written documents from people who died long ago. They would teach them something about the past. There's also artifacts, so things that have been dug up out of the ground, left over from people long ago, displayed in museums. Those are things which teach us a little bit about the past. Even the bodies of people who died long ago, their bones can tell us something about the world that they inherited. And of course, most important of all, our teachers. We all learn something about history because of teachers. But are all of these sources equal? Do they all equally tell us about the past? Are they all equally trustworthy? Do they tell us the same things about the past? Does it even matter what type of source we look at about the past? Historians classify all sources, everything from video games, television shows, to old bones, to artifacts, into two different types. This is the fundamental division in history. There are primary sources, and there are secondary sources. Now let's find out what they are. A primary source is anything, anything at all, which was created by humans in the time period you were studying. So that means it's something from the past, some object or document or something that was created by a human being in a past time period. So for example, you could imagine some sort of written document could be a primary source. If it was created in the time period that you're interested in, then it's a primary source. So imagine you were interested in uh, the 1800s. So uh, 150 years ago or so, then anything written down by a human being during the 1800s would be a primary source for that time period. How about art or paintings, sculptures? If they were created in the time period that you're interested in, then they tell you something about that time period. They're an expression of a human being who was alive during that time period. In particular, paintings are a window on that time period. Prior to photography, paintings are the only sort of colorful depictions we have of a world which is long gone. Of course, old buildings are also a primary source. If they were created in the time period, the buildings or the ruins that are left over are certainly primary sources. 
anything that was made by a human, an artifact, an object. It could be a fork, a fork left over from a couple hundred years ago. If that's the time period that you're interested in studying, then that fork is a primary source. Clothing, if it survives, and in truth be told, not much clothing survives. It tends to be very perishable. But if it did survive to our time period, then it is a primary source from the past. And there are clothing items that have survived from 200, even 300, even 400 years ago. There are pieces of clothing which survive. So they are certainly primary sources. Literature, poems, anything written down, again, it's a primary source. Even if it's artistic, it's a primary source. It's an expression of the writer uh, who was alive in that time. So their ideas, their feelings are all considered relevant primary sources. And of course, anything that's dug up out of the ground from that time period, such as bones or other archaeological remains, all of these are primary sources. Okay, so let's take uh, a specific example. Imagine you wanted to find primary sources for the time period of William Shakespeare. Now, if you've never heard of William Shakespeare, and probably you have, but if you haven't, he was a playwright who lived in London, England, in the late 16th, early 17th century. Um, many of you probably encountered uh, him by being forced to read a play that he wrote in high school, in a high school English class. Okay, so say you were interested in Shakespeare's time period. You wanted to learn more about it. What types of primary sources might be relevant? Well, of course, writings, uh, the things that he wrote down, like plays, poems, his sonnets, all of those are certainly primary sources. They teach you a little bit about the time period that he inhabited. It teaches you a little bit about the man, William Shakespeare. But maybe a little bit less obvious, but still very relevant. What about tax records? They're certainly primary sources. They tell us something about the time period. They were created by humans in that time period. How about buildings? Buildings that existed during the time of Shakespeare are certainly primary sources. Paintings? Well, look at the painting that you're looking at right now. It tells you a little bit about what he looked like. Paintings are certainly primary sources. They can tell us all kinds of things, like the types of clothing that people wore, or what the world looked like. Even a hat. If Bill Shakespeare had a hat and it survived, it would be a primary source. If it was created in the time period that we are studying by a human being, then it is a primary source. Okay, so what about secondary sources then? A secondary source is anything that concerns the past but comes afterwards. So it's not something that was created in the past. So an obvious secondary source would be your textbook, or any book for that matter, about history. They may have lots of information about the past, but they aren't primary sources. They weren't created in the past. They were created afterwards. Magazines about history could be a secondary source, or teachers, of course, are secondary sources. TV shows that you watch are secondary sources. Movies are secondary sources. Video games that you might play, all of these are secondary sources. They were not created in the time period that you're studying by humans. They were created much, much later on. They were created in the present time. So therefore, they're a secondary source. Wikipedia, of course, is a secondary source. Random internet websites that you find are secondary sources. And even peer-reviewed academic research by professional historians, which is, of course, the most important secondary source, is still a secondary source. Another way to look at the difference between primary and secondary sources is... Another way to look at it would be that primary sources are our evidence. They are our clues from the past. They're the only things left over by a long dead people, remnants of a society that has all but disappeared. Now, if primary sources are our evidence, and they are, in fact, our only evidence, they're the only things we have from the past, then by definition, a secondary source must be opinion. Sometimes good opinion, sometimes smart opinion, sometimes well-informed opinion, sometimes crazy opinion, sometimes opinion that's just plain wrong, but opinion nevertheless. All secondary sources, good and bad, are all lumped together as opinion. Okay, so I want to do a thought experiment with you. Imagine for a second that there's been some sort of huge disaster, a nuclear war or a 
um, some sort of uh, disease or something has wiped out all of civilization on Earth. Everything is gone from our time period. It's completely laid to waste. And a thousand years from now, we imagine there's some new civilization of humans that arises and they somehow rebuild society and there are historians in that future time period and they're interested in our time. But nothing survives from our time until a chance discovery. A chance discovery of these pictures from Tim Horton's Camp Day. Now, if you've never heard of Tim Horton's or Camp Day, uh, Tim Horton's is, of course, a, a nationwide coffee shop chain in Canada. And uh, one day of the year on June 1st, they um, take all the proceeds uh, from their um, coffee and it goes towards uh, children's camps where uh, underprivileged children can go to camp for free and have a great time. And it's a nice charity and everyone feels good about it. So that's what Camp Day is. But let's imagine for a second that this is the only thing that survives these photographs from Camp Day. What could future historians conclude about the past based on these photographs alone? Think for a moment. Would they actually know what these children are doing? Would they know that they were playing or would they know that there was a camp? Probably not. They just see children doing different things. They could be training for something. This could be an elite group of child warriors or child assassins. In the upper right hand corner they might be wearing their military uniforms and in the other left hand corner they could be doing a military salute. The kid in the middle looks like he's got his war face on with his you know you know scary grin. There's only a few adults in this these pictures. Perhaps future historians would look at our time period and think wow maybe maybe there wasn't a very long life expectancy and and adults were were very few it was mostly children perhaps they would conclude based on this that we live much closer to nature than we do today because all of the photographs have nature involved in it in some way perhaps they would think that these children are part of some sort of cult that there's a religious ceremony going on all of these would be legitimate hypotheses based on the evidence in front of you there's nothing to say that they wouldn't be correct or couldn't be correct if you had no other information. This demonstrates the great difficulty that historians have when they look at primary sources from the past. A primary source doesn't necessarily um, tell you what you want it to tell you. It's just simply survived from a past time period, sometimes by happen chance. It certainly wasn't created with you in mind. It served a purpose in that time period. So when you are looking at primary sources from the past, you have to be very careful when you're interpreting them. You have to allow for many different and sometimes even contradictory hypotheses. And until you have more evidence, you have to simply say, we don't know. And you'd be surprised at how little we actually don't know about past time periods. So turning back to secondary sources, needless to say, not all secondary sources are created equal. I know it seems obvious, but it's worth saying. What you find on some sort of random website on the internet is not as trustworthy as something that has been shown to you in your textbook. And that is not as trustworthy as something that has been published in a peer-reviewed academic journal by a professional historian. There is a great range of trustworthiness when it comes to secondary sources. So not all secondary sources are even trustworthy to begin with. Some secondary sources present the past incorrectly or wrong. A movie that you watch uh, may or may not depict the past accurately at all. The most important thing for a movie maker to do is to tell a good story. That may mean that they have to change things about the past or they may ignore other things about the past. So what is trustworthy when it comes to a secondary source? So if we grouped what I would consider the trustworthy sources, we would have three different levels of trustworthiness. At the top of the group would be peer-reviewed sources. These are sources which are created by professional historians for other professional historians. They are books and academic journals. They're not generally read by um, most people. It's not meant for the overall general public. These are sources which are highly technical. They're very specific. They use a lot of jargon. They're difficult to read, but they are the highest level of trustworthiness. These sources teach us brand new things about the past. It's where cutting edge research is done about history. 
The next level down is academic sources. Academic sources we encounter in our coursework. An academic source would be your textbook, for instance, or if you go to the museum, or if you read a historical plaque that's called public history. All of that together I would call academic sources. And academic sources do have a reasonable amount of trustworthiness. They're often written by professional historians, but they're different from peer-reviewed sources in a few ways. Number one, they're not trying to do anything new. They're not trying to conduct brand new cutting-edge research about the past. Instead, they're presenting existing research in a way that the general public can understand. They are also not peer-reviewed, and we'll explain what peer review is in a moment. Next down the list would be the history that many of us encounter in our day-to-day -day lives, called popular history. Popular history can take many different forms. It could take the form of a magazine that is about a historical topic for people who are interested in history, sometimes called history buffs. The type of magazines that you could buy about history that you would find in a chapter's indigo are almost certainly popular history. When you watch a TV documentary about a historical subject, like a documentary on the Discovery Channel about ancient Egypt, or a documentary about World War II that you saw on uh, Remembrance Day on television, those are all popular history sources. Again, they can sometimes be reasonably trustworthy, and they do sometimes have professional historians helping out on them. But they're not the same thing as a textbook. They aren't as trustworthy as a textbook, and certainly not as trustworthy as a peer-reviewed academic source. And there are also trustworthy websites. These are websites that are produced by colleges, universities, museums. They, again, these are popular history sites. There are sites that generally are trustworthy, that generally have good information on them, but they're not quite as trustworthy as an academic source or a peer-reviewed source. Peer-reviewed sources. Peer review is the process used by publishers and editors of academic and scholarly journals to ensure that the articles they publish meet the accepted standards of their discipline. So when a historian publishes something via peer review, they submit the work to a body of experts. Their name is removed from their uh, written work so that no bias can be applied, and the body of experts reviews the work to make sure that it meets minimum standards. They're checking the methodology. They're checking to make sure that the historian has cited all their sources. They make sure that it's the highest level of research, and if it meets that requirement, then it can be published, and only then it can be published. This is called peer review. When a historian submits something to peer review, they're usually doing original research. That means that they are looking at something new for the first time, or interpreting something in a new way. Original research is always based on the analysis of primary sources. It's always based on evidence from the past. And as such, original research contributes some new knowledge of the past. So when historians are engaged in original research, they are contributing to our overall understanding of the past. Historiography refers to the history of historical research on a subject. What we know about the past changes over time. This may seem obvious, but what historians wrote about a subject 20-30 years ago may not have been as informed as what historians are writing about now. People change their opinions. New evidence comes to light. Old ideas are replaced by new ideas. Historiography, therefore, is not about the histor history per se. It's about the historians. So if I talk about the historiography of a given subject, say the historiography of chocolate, I'm not talking about the history of chocolate. I'm talking about how historians who write about chocolate have changed their ideas and changed their opinions over time. That's what historiography means. So historiography is the collective body of knowledge on a given subject. Let me give you an example. Women's history is a subject of history. Now, obviously, women have always had a history, uh, but it may surprise you that almost nothing was written on the subject until about the mid-20th century. The historians of the past didn't deem it to be an interesting subject or something worthy of being written on. So if you went back 100 years ago, you would be very hard-pressed to find many books on women's history. 
Today, however, it's a massive subject with many different historians working on it. Therefore, we would say the historiography of women's history has changed dramatically over the past half century. Other subsets of history, on the other hand, compared to women's history, have had lots of notice over the years. Political history, military history, church history. These are subjects that predominantly male historians have been writing about for a long time, at least a hundred years or more in many cases. There are newer subsets of history that are only just now attracting notice, and chocolate history is one of them. That's because food history, the history of food, what we eat, and cultural history are relatively new subjects of interest for historians, so the historiography does not go back as far in time. In fact, the history of chocolate has really been only going for the past 20-30 years. One of the most important scholars, recent scholars, on the history of chocolate is Marcy Norton, for instance. So Marcy Norton, when she wrote her book Sacred Gifts and Profane Pleasures, A History of Tobacco and Chocolate in the Atlantic World, challenged the existing theories on how chocolate came to be um, eaten and drank by Europeans. Originally, uh, historians had assumed that when Europeans encountered chocolate, which was at that time a bitter drink that Mesoamericans enjoyed, so it wasn't sweet, uh, that Europeans didn't like it and that they quote unquote fixed chocolate. They made it better by adding sugar and changing it into something that we would be more familiar with today. So Marcy Norton looked at the evidence and looked at the primary sources and she disagreed. She said that there was no evidence to suggest that Europeans had immediately changed chocolate once they encountered it. Rather, in the beginning, after an initial period of distaste, they started to like it, and they started to like it just the way the Mesoamericans drank it. And for a long time, Europeans didn't add sugar to their chocolate. But over time, it did eventually change, and Europeans did eventually add sugar, and it did eventually turn into the sweet confectionery that we know today. But that was a slower process than it was originally thought. So when Marcy Norton published her book, she was contributing to the historiography of chocolate. And in fact, she was changing the historiography. So if I was telling the story of the history of the historians of chocolate, I'd be talking about the historiography of chocolate, and I would be sure to mention Marcy Norton. And finally, a quick note about dating systems used in history and how we'll use dating systems in this course. Many of you might be familiar with the old dating system, which is the AD-BC system. So if we were to say the year that the search engine Google was founded, in our formal way we might say Google was founded in the year 1998 AD. AD stands for Anno Domini, in the year of our Lord. It's a Latin phrase. It does not stand for after death, which is a popular misconception. BC stands for before Christ. Now obviously this entire dating system um, is a Christian calendar. It's uh, predicated on the idea that AD, the first year, so year one, starts with the birth of Jesus. And then BC, we count backwards in time before the birth of Jesus. Uh, the system was developed in the 6th century by monks living in medieval Europe. There's been a movement over the past few years for historians to adopt a more neutral dating system, one that reflects that we are not all Christian, um, even if we are all um, using the old Christian calendar. So the new system replaces AD and BC with CE and BCE. So CE becomes Common Era and BCE becomes Before Common Era. CE equals AD or BCE equals BC. For the purposes of this course, we'll use CE and BCE. But you should still be familiar with the old system because you'll find it all over the place still in use. Um, some textbooks still use it, often museums still use it, and sometimes even I will forget and still use it as well.